Well, good morning, Lighthouse. Today in our devotions, we're going to start the book of 2 Corinthians. And 2 Corinthians can be a challenging book, in part because it's a lot about suffering. In part, it's one of the places where Paul most talks about himself. Sometimes he sounds like he's maybe um, highlighting his suffering in a way that you think, man, or what are you trying to prove here? Are you trying to make us feel bad for you? And also it's partly uh, um, he sounds kind of braggy as he's defending his his role as an apostle. He's defending his ministry. There are times when you go, hey, Paul, OK, we get it. You're awesome. You're the apostle Paul. And without the context of knowing the relationship he had with the people in Corinth and the occasion of the letter, it's going to be really hard to kind of get away from those things. And and um, so let's talk just a little bit. Here's what you need to know. Of course, there's a whole field of study over this, but here's what you need to know before you start digging into Second Corinthians is, first of all, this is at least the fourth letter that Paul sent to the people in Corinth. When we have our first Corinthians, he has obviously already written a letter to them. He refers to it. And then as we read in Second Corinthians, he refers to maybe a harsh letter of rebuke that he had sent to them before. So, so there are at least four correspondence back and forth. And so he's referring to letters they've sent him. He was in Corinth for quite a while. And so he knows these people well. So he is not writing to the universe. He's not writing to me and you. This is one of my favorite ways to say it. Uh, I think I stole this from Tim Mackey. Go watch every video Tim Mackey ever made. Um, but the, the Bible is not written to you, but it is written for you. So if we're going to understand what Paul is saying, and if we're going to be able to apply it to our lives, we're going to have to understand who it was written to uh, and his original intent, the original context. So that's one of the first things. He doesn't say, hi, my name's Paul. This is all of my suffering. And here's why I'm an apostle. No, rather, this is after a, in the middle of uh, a long relationship with these people where he has demonstrated love. He has lived with them. He's worked alongside them. He, you know, was instrumental in planning the church. He's encouraged the church. He's rebuked the church. He has um, really shepherded and pastored this church for a long time. So then why all this writing about suffering, in particular his suffering, and and then why all the defense of, of his, um, you know, role as an apostle? Well, it's because people had come into the church at Corinth and they had started telling stories about Paul's suffering and had started to say, look, if God was really with Paul, all of this stuff wouldn't be happening to him. You guys can't trust Paul because if God really loved him, his life wouldn't be as hard as it is. And that is something we probably still struggle with is, is suffering in this world a sign that God disapproves? As we suffer, does it prove that we are not trustworthy? People shouldn't listen to us as we talk about God or that we have erred in some way. Can we measure God's approval? Can we measure the veracity and helpfulness of preaching by the amount of suffering in a person's life? Now, I think you and I would quite obviously say, well, Jesus suffered a lot. We can trust what he says. All of the apostles suffered a lot. We trust what they say. Not only that, Jesus predicted or guaranteed that we would have trouble in this world. Certainly good, faithful, godly people suffer and can be trusted. And success in this world, while is wonderful and there are successful, you know, um, powerful people who don't experience a lot of suffering. I would say that's a lot of, a lot of us, you know, in, in, in our culture, we don't have this, at least at our church, we don't have a lot of folks in that kind of deep poverty stricken oppression that you see maybe in the developing world. And so we would be glad to say, yeah, things going well in this world are no sign that somebody's given up on the faith or whatever. And also suffering in this world is no sign that God disapproves of a person, but rather um, Paul wants to point out, no, my suffering is for Christ. You can trust me. So even as Paul is saying, hey, this is what I've gone through and this is why I've gone through it. His hope is not that they would worship or, or, or um, honor him, but rather that they would worship and honor Christ. 
And I think that's an important part of reading any work or hearing any sermon or watching any video is, is the intent to point people to Jesus. And for Paul, it certainly was. I'm really fond of saying um, this. You've heard me say it before. And <laughs> just reading through 2 Corinthians, I'm going to say this a lot. In life, there are always two stories going on. There is always the story of this world, which is mostly suffering. There is always the story of the bad things that are happening and the tensions in your life and, and problems and cultural, you know, tragedies and natural disasters. There's always that story going on. There's also always the story of God's faithfulness. And as believers, we have to decide which is real, which is the deepest truth. Is the deepest truth suffering and sorrow and tragedy and the grave is the end? Or is the deeper truth God's continual comfort, God's continual salvation, and the tomb not being the end for any of us, but rather that we are headed not for death and destruction, but for eternal life and glory? These are important questions. And so Paul has been confronted by the church at Corinth with, Something like this. We don't have a record of, of what exactly they were saying, but something like, hey, Paul, we've seen how much you're suffering. It doesn't seem like God's with you. We're not sure we can trust you. So Paul starts off in chapter one, and I hope you've read chapter one. Stop right now and go read your Bible. Um, in verse three of chapter one, he says, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of mercies and God of all comfort. Paul says, yeah. He's going to talk a lot about his suffering, and they already know a lot of these stories. And he says, yeah, you're right. There's been a lot of suffering, but let me tell you the actual story. My life has not been the story of suffering and sorrow. My life has been the story of God's comfort in the middle of suffering and sorrow. Verse 4 says, who comforts us in all our affliction. The affliction is real. Paul's not going to say, oh, Suffering, it's not true. I'm not suffering. I'm enjoying persecution. No, he's, but, he, but he says in the middle of all our affliction, God has comforted us. That's the truth of life in Christ. The truth of life in Christ is not that there will not be suffering, not that there will not be sorrow. The truth of life in Christ is that you will not be alone in those times. That in the middle of sorrow, in the middle of suffering, God will comfort you. It's mystical. Can't prove it. Come and taste and see that the Lord is good. But I bet many of you would say that has been my story, that God has faithfully comforted me. Verse four continues, whom comforts all of us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Paul says it's not just that God has been here and comforted us, but he's even redeemed our suffering, redeemed our affliction in such a way where we are now better able to minister to people who are going through things. So people are looking at Paul and going, man, the story of your life is suffering and sorrow. And Paul goes, no, the story of my life is God's provision and comfort in the middle of suffering and sorrow, even to the point where now I'm able to comfort other people. That is a vastly different story. Look down at verse nine. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. He's not ducking. He's not saying, no, we haven't suffered. No, he's saying, yeah, we've had times where we felt like we were going to die. But verse nine continues, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. So Paul says, look, our suffering has produced fruit. It has produced fruit in that we are now able to help other people who are suffering. And it has also produced the fruit of giving us opportunity, challenging us, teaching us to rely on God. So if you're suffering, this is an opportunity for you to receive comfort from God to such a profound degree that you can comfort other people in their affliction and also an opportunity for us to learn to rely on God. Enjoy. Second Corinthians. Be loved.